Yeah. Okay. Very good. Perfect, Phil. Thank you. All right. Attendance by roll call. Okay, I'm here. Check me off. Uh, <laughs> Brian. Yes. Wayne. Yes. Welcome back. Greg. Yes. Oh, here's here. Good. Uh, Justin DeMarco. Here. Mary. Yes. Uh, Hillary. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Rob Rullo. Let me see him. Uh, Jennifer Gaudet. Here. Perfect. Justine. Here. Krista Silva. Mark Anderson. Yes. <clears throat> Anthony. Anthony yeah. Midday, I know I saw you. I see you there. Matt Johan. Here. Uh, Nick Kane. Here. Yeah, good, perfect. Uh, that's it for voting members. I'll read the governor's statement. Yeah, that went. Pursuant to Governor Baker's executive order dated July 16th, 2022, extending certain pandemic related policy measures. This authorizes the continuation of remote meeting and public access under the open meeting law. This meeting will be held virtually using Zoom technology. Um, Phil, before I turn it over to you, I would like to, uh, is Ken Newhouser on? I yeah, I thought I saw him. Yeah, Jerry, I'm here. All right, um, I was gonna do a vote on minutes, uh, from our last meeting, but Ken sent me a note earlier today. He had a couple of clarifications. I just wanted to allow him to uh, air those clarifications. And and Frank, I, I see you on here. Um, I think a couple of the clarifications might be uh, regarding statements that you had made during our last meeting. So go ahead, Ken. Yeah. So there, there were two, and one um, I thought it important to capture uh, Frank's observation that the dehumidified or dehumidification ventilation system uh, will that together with the, the cooling provided at the gym and other spaces will meet the comfort needs in the school as far as cooling. Except for very extreme days, yes. Okay, and, and I think the other thing you, you also explained that the the size of the system in, in particular the ground source heat pump system was driven by the cooling load i don't think i said that that was probably marty i don't think marty was with us so it was um i don't remember making that statement it might have been someone else you're saying that the size of the equipment has to do with the cooling load it, oh that, no! That, that, that of the rooftop equipment for the uh, displacement system. No, uh, this is specifically explaining the 200 tons for the ground source heat pump system. No, I wouldn't have explained that. Mm, okay. That wasn't me. All yeah, right, Marty. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I'm not sure if there was a question or just a clarification from the previous meeting. I guess a clarification. Um, I'm, I'm I'm sorry, Ken. What, what was the, the question specifically for it? So it was, um, that, now this is as remembering, and I could have sworn it was Frank, but I'll, I'll check the uh, recording so I know if I'm crazy or not. But um, as far as the load for the system, that that is generally driven by the cooling load. Um, again, if, if we're, depending on what systems we're, we're speaking of, and I think maybe that was part of it. I wasn't at the meeting, but um you know say for a standard package rooftop unit for a gym or something like that say um that would be driven by the cooling load um on the geothermal obviously it's the the full load of, of the building um because you do have some load sharing between heating and cooling and not necessarily um cooling is the <clears throat> highest demand in all cases We okay, Ken? Yeah, I guess if okay. if nobody else recalls um, that it was explained that cooling is the driver for that sizing, then I will 
pull that one back. Well, I, I would never have made that statement. I'm not a mechanical engineer. Everybody, else, I would I would have prefaced it by saying uh, or deferring to uh, Marty or somebody mm -hmm. else. And I don't remember, you know, specifically. So I, yeah. Jerry, I think Mary has her hand up. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Sorry, you're right. Thanks, Mary. Sorry, Jerry. I, I probably should have sent these to you ahead of time. No, it was just a couple of additional thoughts. Um, when we were talking about the different options, um, there was the comment about the geothermal option having the highest upfront cost. And I, I wanted to know if we should add a paragraph after that, basically to say if we go with either of the heat pump options, that we'd have we'd bond at the full price and that and then um that the incentives would come one to two years later. So because that seems to have come up a couple of times. Um, so that was just just a thought there. And then um the Discussion highlights were as follow on the third page, number two, um, talking about the gas boiler. And I was thinking we could add something to the effect of the system can be converted to one of the two heat pump options at the end of the cycle. Just for further clarification. Yes, that, I believe Marty made that point yep. yeah. that the equipment, well, I mean, at the end of the cycle, you're probably going to at least upgrade or maybe replace the equipment in 20 years. Right. So, um, but you know, but you would have the same type of, uh, you could still use heat pumps um, right. and, and, and run the, uh, the same uh, ventilation, so the displacement ventilation. Right, yeah, that was my point, Frank. Basically the infrastructure is there yeah. um, to be able to, to convert <clears throat> if, if, you know, if we choose to at that point. Right. So I guess at this moment, I would suggest that we uh, possibly hold off on these minutes. Let's make these adjustments and we'll vote these minutes uh, uh, for approval at the next uh, scheduled meeting. Sounds good. And I'll um, I'll send you up the, the language that I was thinking of, but you can do with what you want with it. All right. Send it to me in uh, right. copy Phil and Al. Sounds perfect. All right. Thank you. All right, Phil. Go Thank for you. it. All right. I'm going to share my screen. So there were two main agenda items we wanted to go over um, today since we last met a couple of weeks ago. So at last building committee meeting, the selection to go with a gas fired system was made. And there was a question, I believe, by Matt Johan regarding how that complies and or are there issues with that complying with uh, the updates, the 2023 updates to the stretch code. Um, so Mount Vernon Group wanted to speak in, in more detail to that, as well as since we last met, um, they attended a roundtable on this specific topic. And then the next big picture agenda item is, is when we presented a couple of weeks ago about the IRA incentives relative to going geothermal. You know, we presented that Mount Vernon Group has had attended a couple roundtables and, and it's still TBD as whether that IRA incentive covers the full HVAC system or just the geothermal portion. So we were just gonna re-highlight that again because they attended more roundtables since we last met as a building committee. So Chris, if you wanna take it away. Sure, thanks Phil. So um, looking at the stretch code and the opt-in code and the baseline building energy code that is recently updated, um, there's a number of tiers, there's actually four tiers. So We'll first go with the baseline building energy code. So this is modeled after the uh, international code. It's got the mass, uh, you know, qualifiers, if you will. Everybody must meet this at a very minimum, regardless of your building. And then, so you go to the stretch code requirements, which is tier two. These are for green communities, of which Maynard is one. Um, you meet the minimum, but the stretch code requires a more efficient, high-performance building envelope. Um, spoke with a representative from the DOER. And the goal is to make sure that buildings, um, the, the envelope or enclosure, if you will, is as efficient and high performance um, as it can be, regardless of the methodology of which how you heat it, whether it's gas fired, all electric air source heat pumps, uh, ground source, et cetera. And what they've indicated is by, by requiring this higher performance building envelope, it's going to result in a smaller energy demand. Um, and that's what they're really looking to do. It used to be uh, you know, a number of different ways. You have a, a good performing building, and then you would look at the energy use. Well, they've changed that to look at the energy demand 
and create a smaller energy demand, which would result in an HVAC system size to reflect that reduced energy demand. So that's that's what we're going to be required to do with the stretch code for tier two as part of this project as it currently sits. Mixed fuel use is allowable under a stretch code tier two requirement. Um, we are still going to be required to adhere to the building closure prescriptive requirements. You know, the fenestrations, the openings, the types, the wall systems, um, you know, the roof systems and, and how that works. As part of that, there are going to be additional um, commissioning requirements, if you will, and looking at the, the building envelope as a whole and not just specific components overall. And then what they've done as part of this is there's a number of different pathway requirements to meet that. And for commercial buildings greater than 20,000 square feet and schools, the thermal energy demand intensity pathway requirement is what we'll have to follow. So that's just a way of measuring um, the demand intensity for this building. So Phil, if you go to the next slide. Now with the municipal opt-in code, there are additional requirements and this is considered a tier three. This is something that would have to be, um, the town of Maynard would have to apply for, the DOR would, would review that and recommend it, et cetera. And basically was it takes the stretch code requirements and then adds these three big picture requirements, if you will. So this uh, opt-in code is going to accelerate the transition to clean energy um, in the future, requiring future all electric. And what this does is uh, gas fired systems are still allowed or, or fuel, fossil fuels, um, but it will require pre-wiring for future electric space heating and water heating. So even though we put in, let me rephrase that. So even though the district would choose to go to a gas fired system for heating, um, we would have to still pre-wire for electric heating as well in the future. And then this requirement also provides a requirement for 1.5 watts per square foot on-site solar renewable energy vendor that's from the high school for solar renewable energy. Um, and the work that they did for our school, uh, the roof is capable of more than meeting this requirement. So we outfit the roof system with the solar renewable energy that is planned, uh, will meet the um, requirements for a tier three code. And then there's the, the next step, which again is, uh, a municipal opt-in requirement, if you were, it's tier four. And this pretty much uh, makes sure that your building is fossil fuel free and is fully electrified. So we've looked at this, I've, I've spoken with um, the DORE representative that's, that's kind of putting all this together and explaining this. Um, we've looked at um, the round table that we did with the green engineer who is in fact an additional um, energy modeler, if you will, Eversource uses them, we've used them, and we, we plan on using them on this building. Um, they've kind of confirmed all this information as far as the new requirements. So at this stage, the stretch code and the municipal opt-in tier three, gas-fired or um, fossil fuel systems equipment are allowable. Uh, but, however, the tier three, which is currently not in effect uh, with Maynard, but we understand that may be an option in the fall, um, would accelerate the, the process. Um, so we would pre-wire for electric heating equipment, et cetera. So at the end of the life of the gas fired system or any stage between uh, then and you know now and then, you would be able to switch out your equipment and fully electrify your building. And all of this, regardless of which system, we are gonna be required to meet the stretch energy code requirements for a very high efficient and high performing envelope. Any questions? Yeah, it looks like Nick has one. Yeah, a quick question about tier three, about pre-wiring. Um, as far as I recall, uh, it's not like um, Eversource can pre-wire a larger service for you. The service has to be for we are anticipated load at the time they start it. So even if we did this pre-wiring, this is just our stuff in the building. And if we did change to a more electrified system for tier three or future of tier four, um, they would still have to do quite a bit of work to bring in a new transformer, new service to the building, maybe some switch gear or something of our own would have to change if more power is coming through it. So it's not like a super easy swap. Is that how I'm understanding that? So Nick, as part of that in the pre-wiring, we would have to calculate all those loads up front as part of the initial design. Um, and 
we've kind of done that initially when the subcommittee, the sustainability subcommittee initially chose to go with the air source. So our electrical engineer has kind of already been going that route. What is the transformer size? What are the load sizes? What kind of switch gear are we, we're gonna need? So that will already re be required to be in place as part of the project. Yeah, oh. just to add to that, Nick. So Eversource isn't gonna dictate the switch gear size we put into our main electrical room. So we'll make sure it's sized where um, if Eversource won't provide a electrical service to account for switching to all electric, at least the switch here in the main electrical room will be readily you know, ready for it in the event they still have to do the exterior work, new transformer, et cetera. Okay. Does the, uh, did we, do we have to get, do we have to pay a fee? We'll call it whatever, an engineering fee if we're going to have Eversource come back in X number of years and bring in something new. There's got to be some dollars attached to that. Is what I'm thinking. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jennifer. I think I might have had a similar question, but in a more general sense. So if I, when we talked last time about that at the end of the life cycle of the gas powered unit that we could replace it with an all electrical component that all of the infrastructure was there this is sounding like the infrastructure isn't necessarily there that we're going to have to do additional electrical work on the electrical components in order to do that am i understanding that correctly and would we, i guess if that is in fact the case would we have likely have to do that work anyway because some of the electrical components are going to be at their end of life cycle as well? Um, so the electrical components should be fine. They should not be at the end of life cycle. So when we do this design, Jennifer, right from the start, um, should the committee say, you know, vote to go with the, you know, the gas fired system, we will design the building to do that. But the, on the electrical side, we will design the electrical to take the switch gear, the connections, et cetera, the sub panels to take the um, the future electrical equipment. So when you take out your gas boilers, you bring in your electrical equipment, um, have an electrician connect it all. And then as Phil mentioned, um, Eversource may have to do some service upgrade to the building, but you know the switch gear and, and everything else should be in place as part of this design. All right, perfect, thank you. Now, Justin. All right. Just to kind of add to Nick's um, overall understanding of the infrastructure aspect. So just understand that if we don't have an on-site solar generation to offset the electrical load, when we move towards that process, if we move towards that process in 20 years and we go to an all electric system to modernize the building and meet uh, 2050 net zero, we'd have another discussion with on-site solar to offset the electrical. That would have to be redesigned on Eversource's transmission lines as it currently has to be done now with our solar project of the high school. So technically, whoever we would acquire or procure for our solar is subject to doing a design engineering standpoint with Eversource and the solar PV company. So if they size their electrical components on their transmission line to only fit our potential load now, and we move to an all electric system in the future, and we're talking about reintroducing on-site solar PV, let's just say in 20, 30 years, solar PV has exponentially increased in efficiency and the uh, uh, amount of square footage or acreage that would be required to help offset the electrical load is down five times what we need now. The transmission line would have to be engineered at that time to meet the load that we're required and the potential backload that the PV would be providing to the grid. This is an absolute need necessity guarantee and Eversource does not like to upsize their transmission lines until there is an absolute no. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, Chris, we'll, we'll want to coordinate with select on that. Absolutely. Um, Justine. Yeah, I just wanted to um, clarify for uh, for Jen Gaudet. I think that what we were talking about last meeting was that we had given the option that we we could at the end of the useful life um, switch to all electric, but I don't think we had given the direction to the um, design team to do that yet, which is probably why that we're revisiting it now. But um, so I think that was part of the. I just wanted to clarify that. 
Yeah, thanks. I think uh, similar to Nick, I was just trying to understand what potential costs we're talking about. Granted, it's 30, 20 years in the future, 30 years in the future um, to make that move. Because um, it, it sounds like it's not a one for one swap out. We're going to have to get rid of the equipment anyway. There will be some costs incurred, but it would let it doesn't sound like it's we're going to have to rewire the entire building, et cetera, et cetera. It sounds like it's minor from my understanding. Yes. yes. Uh, Mary, did you have your hand up? Oh, oh sorry. I just muted. Um, my fault. No worries. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I wouldn't blame you. Um, <laughs> no. so just, just so I understand. So the municipal opt-in code additional requirements, that's an option that we can go with? Or I think Chris said that might be a direction that the town's going in the fall. So does that mean it's going to mandate us to go that way? Yeah. So we got an email from Greg that it sounds like potentially part of the fall town vote, fall town meeting, there'll be a vote for Maynard to, to go with the opt-in tier three level. Okay. Okay. So right, right now it's not in place, but we heard it could be in place by fall this year. And okay. if that's the case, um, you know, we, we need to have that implemented in our project. Understandable. And um, do we know what additional costs this will be? I mean, we're talking about extra electrical and that. Um, and also, will the MSBA or anybody else reimburse us for any of it? Well, so on the MSBA topic, you, you know, so we've already presented, you know, high level kind of local share versus MSBA share. We're already well above kind of their building cost per square foot. So, you know, um, as we go through value engineering, we're going to do the best we can to reduce that local share number. Um, but I wouldn't worry about kind of lumping in MSBA. Do they cover that? Do they cover that? Uh, as it relates to building costs, they, they, they cap it at a certain number. Um, we're going to be above that just because that's what the market is right now. Um, okay. So whatever additional costs this will entail will be on us. Okay. You can, you can say that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then, Chris, I mean, to, to clarify, like, so at this point in our design, we currently have an electrical service that can that will cover this, that will cover this tier three requirement. Yes. Um, the change that's going to happen in reaction to the last building committee meeting is 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 going to gas fired, not not the the air source system. Um, yes. So ultimately, like so, like Justine mentioned. You know, we want to hear from the building committee. Are you guys okay with us maintaining that electrical service size that we currently have that, you know, the engineers feel like will comply with this tier three? Um, or do you want them to look at downsizing it um, to an electrical service size that just kind of fits the current electrical design, if you will? Um, Justin, it looks like you got your hand up. Yeah, I guess I'll start this. So we're trying to find a happy balance between modernization of an existing potentially built school in the next year or two and high level political legislative policy that is just starting to roll out. One of the best things we can do when we're planning for 20, 30, 50 years, which we have to do significantly um, in the public works realm, is to prepare ourselves with cost-effective measures that allow for transformation of assets that have life expectancy of over 30, 40 years. The nominal cost of meeting the tier three compared to the extreme cost of implementation of all electric systems right now without, you know, without certainty of financial return, to me, just me speaking on this, I believe keeping with our infrastructure to handle a tier three and a potential swap in 20 to 30 years of the um, HVAC components is the smart solution now. It is one that reduces the overall upfront costs yet meets sustainable goals in the future. And those assumptions will most likely be flushed out in the next several years. Just remember this school is being built and it was, its life expectancy is anywhere between 50 and 60 years. The HVAC components life expectancy is 20 to 25 years. We will have to change out the HVAC components halfway through this building's life. So if we're prepared to move in that direction now, we're making a smart decision that incorporates all of our stakeholders, 
wants, needs, et cetera, to really kind of capture the community goals while being fiscally responsible, or, excuse me, fiscally responsible and at the same time making decisions on knowns, not assumptions. So if I were to vote right now, I would vote to keep the tier three system components, which is size conduits at a larger scale, wiring systems that are larger and capable of handling an all electric system, solar structures on the roof, which we've already discussed, which is really a load capacity issue and some conduit that allows for that solar PV to be integrated into the system. These are a potential low cost option in my eyes. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Jennifer? Justin, I agree with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, if we're not moving in the direction because we can't for all electric now, putting ourselves in a position where we can do it in the future without incurring major cost savings on us. Any other comments or questions from building committee folks? Okay, um, Hillary Griffith, go ahead, Hillary. Um, so how much extra will meeting this tier three cost? And does that change, like, does that change the calculations for the decision at the last meeting and that if the extra money is being spent to get ready for all electric, does is that like some of the money that's going to that money that was already counted in the calculations for an all electric system two weeks ago? Chris, you want to take that? Does it make a lot of um, sense? <laughs> yeah, so based on our last meeting um, where I think the committee was moving to the gas fired system, we were still maintaining the electrical system for the previous all electric building, if that makes sense. It's not the electricals, it's the capacity of the system. Right. So it's incremental. In other words, if you have the wiring and everything uh, that's there for just the gas fired and it, you have a little bit more capacity to cover all electric. So it's the same wiring, but we just do a little bit heavier wiring I mean, to put it in layman's terms. Is that correct? Yeah, that is. But it's not, it doesn't have a big impact on the price. On okay, the cost thank you. Of, yeah. um, Nick? And unmuted. Um, just so uh, one more sort of zooming back uh, observation here. Uh, when we're talking about doing a future all electric, um, it would be a conversion from the gas fired system. So it would be the simplest path would be to make it a electric uh, central plant. Um, there isn't actually, I, so I think I had some, some worries in my mind about having to chase wiring through the whole building to bring space heating at electrical capacity to every classroom. It's not, it's just a swap over in the plant. Right. Yeah. That's so. So the yeah, amount of correct. things we're chasing is a very small run from A to B inside a room. As we go from a controls of a gas fired boiler that goes away, you put in an electric system and you bring larger wires to that one thing in that one place. Right. right. Yeah. So that might help everybody get an idea that it's it's not so much pre wiring a whole building for electric space heating. It's 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 pre wiring in your central plant to go from the one gas fired device to a single electric. Uh, energy supply device or system in the one room. Correct. Okay. And Maybe other else was already there. I just got there in my mind. Sorry. I was going to say thanks, Nick. That actually helped a lot. No, that, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. You know, some people might just be quiet. No, that was good. That was helpful. So. Um, so we'll just continue to carry it that way. I don't know that we need a hard vote. I mean, it sounds like we have a building committee consensus. So we'll continue to carry the electrical service size the way it's it's been in the schematic design set. And um, we'll go that route. So next item, and it actually speaks to Roger Stillwater had a message in the chat um, about the IRA incentive. So Chris, you want to go to that? 
Uh, sure. So this is a slide that we have shown at the last meeting with, with some of the options. Um, and the biggest unknown at this point is the IRA incentives. Um, so once again, we, we attended a, you know, a couple of symposiums or roundtables to discuss some of the, the upgrades in the codes, Eversource's incentives and the, and the IRA's incentives. Um, we did reach out to uh, the people that Acton is using. Um, as you may remember from the last meeting, um, Acton built their building before the IRA incentives were signed and put in place. I did speak to the director of sustainability and, and building performance um, for that project. And she referred me to the people that they are using to help the town look at possibly obtaining some of those IRA incentives, even though the building has been completed. Um, that individual, um, Eben Perkins, I think was his name, um, basically said the same thing that at this point, it's still unknown. The incentives are very new. Uh, you have to apply for them and whether they cover the entire HVAC system or just the heat pumps and the wells is unknown. Um, we've talked to others, including the DOER, um, their representative could not tell either way which it applies to. Um, everybody is saying that um, as with the town of Acton, they are engaging a tax accountant to weed through it because uh, that's the portion that gets covered, um, but they didn't have any any response. So at this point, there's still no known um, decision as to how much it would cover. Um, as you can see in this, this slide under geothermal pumps, if it covered 40% of your total cost, that's close to $4 million. But if it's 40% of the well and heat pumps, then you're down to just under a million dollars. Um, they all did say that these would not be paid out for a year or two after the systems were built in place and functioning. Um, so we still don't know, they don't know. I don't know any questions on that, but um, everybody we've been talking to um, is kind of the same opinion. There's, there's just, nobody knows yet. Go ahead, Justine. I just wanted to um, say that, you know, and, and I understand the, the possibility of um, the Inflation Reduction Act, and I commend trying to take advantage of, of any money we can. Um, but I was thinking about how it relates to, um, and I actually sent this email to somebody else, how it relates to you know other federal money that we have gotten in the past. And so the big one for us is the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, you know, we had we got about three point two million dollars. Well, part of that money is actually going to a company that is helping us administer the program because there are so many laws and so many requirements handed down from, the, the federal government that that we have to make sure that all our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted and, and we can't make a mistake. So these things aren't necessarily the easiest things to understand. And so especially with you know having it pretty brand new, I, I again I think it's fantastic that it will be an option at some point. Um, but I'm just still not convinced that I, I, I need to go with the tried and true just because um, Maynard as a town with our budget, with our general operating budget between town and schools, we need something we can count on. And this is something that we can count on. Um, Justin. Hi, I just wanna kind of piggyback off of what Justine's talking about in regards to ARPA and what happened with the town of Maynard. Uh, a large majority of that funding was allocated to water and sewer under my department, under our um, four phase long-term capital improvement plan. I will tell you that over two years after ARPA's act, we're still receiving guidance from the US Treasury on programmatic allowance and criteria measures. Even though we've indicated certain projects meeting the overall premise of the act, those programmatic criteria are still being weeded out through federal um, authorities and through the state policies and procedures that they funnel down to. Um, 
I will tell you the simplistic nature of ARPA said that any of those localized funds that were allocated to the town of Maynard could be used for water and sewer. That's exactly how the act read. And then two years later, water and sewers started to be defined by the U.S. House, uh, the Treasury, and um, EPA. And then that is later defined by the state of Massachusetts, DP, DEP. So as we think the money is allocated for the simplistic nature of water sewer or heat pumps, as that act gets defined and moves down the authorities that pretty much control the funding and the um, overall auditing processes, that criteria gets steeper, tighter, tighter, and tighter as the money starts to be allocated. So just keep that in mind. It's not uncommon, and we're dealing with it right now with our ARPA funds. Thanks, Justin. Um, Anthony Mitty. Yeah, hang on, I'm just trying to get my camera on here so you can see me. Yeah, so what uh, one thing not to to you know, to muddy the water, or maybe this, this is going to take take this on onto the tangent is that so one of the things that I you know I've raised before, and you know Justine, we've discussed a lot about is the far is we is we can't we can't ignore the political aspect of it. Now, am I mistaken? And I was not at the select board meeting, Justine, but my understanding is that there was. Um, that uh, uh, that uh, there was some raise that about when you know this was presented as far as like you know a switching over, switching their recommendation over to the gas boiler that there was uh, pointed out by I believe uh, but I believe it was David Gavin I was told uh, that you know we've already agreed to go to these net zero sorts of things and so that this is going back in the opposite direction. So from a political standpoint, one of the things is that and I don't know the answer to this is. So we've heard at one forum that people were like, well, that's too much money, but now we're hearing, but now we're starting to hear that those who really want us to go, you know, that, that are fully in support of this, you know, you using the net, you know, achieving the net zero with this now are, you know, want it with the other. So as far, so as far as that goes, what I see, and I don't know how it, how it plays is that there's this sort of, and I know we can't make everybody happy, but there's a split. There's it. So there's a group that will more than happily go in and vote for the building with the higher cost. And then there's going to be those who balk at the cost. And the problem is we have no idea what on an end mass when it comes to a townwide vote. I, mean, what, I feel like we're missing information as far as the, you know, as overall. And yes, I know we're never going to, it's never going to be unanimous. And, and I understand that, but, uh, the part that I you know, periodically raised the concern uh, about the vote, and one of the reasons why I encourage a lot more forums, and I think is that is getting more of that feedback. And I just I'm concerned now because uh, you know we've heard it from both sides that you know uh, where do we stand as far as I know what it is for a cost, and I get the numbers and I get the science. I believe in the science. Don't get me wrong, but I'm trying to wrap my head around now, like you know where. We're at a fork in the road. I'm trying to wrap, wrap my head around what's 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 actually best. And I just want to raise that point. I so I kind of feel like in this again, personal opinion. Um, so again, I, I was at the meeting um and we did hear from uh many residents who uh encouraged us to go um fossil fuel free, uh, which is I, I and I heard their I heard their concerns. Um and the other part of that is I've had a number of people this week approach me to tell me that um, they thank me for trying to keep the cost down. Um, you know, so so to your point, Anthony, I don't think there right now, <sighs> what I would love is I would love for everyone to see how hard we are working to compromise and to make it a building that we as an entire town can be proud of. Um, because I don't want, I was trying to think of this on the way home, is it you don't want perfect to be the enemy of the good? Is that what it is? So I, I, I feel like that's almost where we're at is we've, we've, we're adding so many different things to this building. It's gonna be probably the most sustainable building we've ever built. 
Um, we're taking into consideration what to do in 20 years when we can switch it out. We are, you know, taking into consideration the opt-in tier three codes that might pass a town meeting in the fall, might not pass, but we're going to have it ready for it because we want to make these compromises. We want everybody on the same page and we really want this project supported because bottom line, as Jerry said at the last meeting, first and foremost, we need a school. And right now, the boiler that's sitting there in Green Meadow right now is not doing anyone any favors. And, uh, you know, something that I just found out the other day is, and again, this gets way into the weeds, and I'm sorry that I'm this far into the weeds at this point, but even our, elect, our, our the where we get our electricity from, it's something I had brought up at the last meeting, and the, we get our electricity from gas-fired source, gas, so, fossil fuels, gas sources, and that number has gone up by 3% in the last year. So our dependence on gas for our electricity has increased in the past year or two. So I'm, we're working really hard to make this a building that everybody can be proud of. And, and I really just am hoping that people will see that this is what we're struggling with, I guess. Yeah, I, I think that's fair, Justine. I just that, uh, you know, this is, you know, having heard this from both sides, and I just figure this is the place where you know we you know we need yeah. to, to, to we need to weigh all you know all of the all of the uh, the, the input yet. and I agree with you. We have done you know we are doing a lot to that too. One of the other concerns that was raised to me was that okay, but that's some of the some of the numbers, and, and certainly I'll let the the pros speak to this. We're banked on the fact that that's going to continue with the, the gas rate, but then how does that change? As the future, as the the generation part of the electrical goes out of the fossil fuel and more into the other, so in which case, then you know, that's going to affect the cost in the long term numbers. But I mean, I'm not sure how you project that out, and I don't know if there's any. But that was another concern that was raised. Commodities. What's that? I said it's commodities. It's futures. <laughs> <laughs> orange juice, right? Bet on orange juice. But they, uh, uh, so just. Throwing that out there is just you know I, it's it, none of it's perfect. So, but that's, but those are the well, things that you know. So. The other the other part that I've noticed is, and when push comes to shove, if we did 100% solar on site generation, then I would be in a completely different situation than I am right this second. But if you look at the energy cost per year and the maintenance per year. Take the $3 million bonus that you could get for geothermal out, because yes, that'll, that could happen, which would then lower the total life cycle because you're dividing it over 20 years. But if you look at every year, this, and again, it's an estimate and I understand that the operation of a gas fired system is less. And we have had, I mean, we're, we're having our budget subcommittee meeting tomorrow night and we're talking about our super tight budget that everybody wants a piece of. And, you know, so we, unless we have 100% on-site solar, we're not going to be able to add additional, that much more energy costs. It's going to be more expensive anyways than it is right now, but we can't add on top of that. Um, Ken. Yeah, found the unmute button. Um, since we have Marty here, um, hoping he could maybe remind us of what the distribution is for the gas-fired boiler scenario. To set a baseboard or or some other, could you could you explain what that is and what it looks like in the classrooms? Um, yeah, if if we stay with the conventional um, displacement ventilation system, um, we would typically have baseboard in the classroom. To maintain uh, heating, so it would be hot water baseboard uh, produced by the condensing boilers um, scattered throughout. Um, other areas of the building uh, would be air handle units with hot water and chilled water coils. And what what temperature hot water would that be? Uh, we try to design around low temp. Depends a little on the envelope, but would probably be in the 130 range, 130 degree range to 120 yeah. degree. All right. Um, trying to keep the boilers condensing as often as possible. All right. 
Are you aware of a heat pump technology that can heat water that high? Uh, no. So the heat pump water distribution would be slightly lower than that. So, um, you know, it'd be a little bit more, uh, you know, active fin on the fin tube for each classroom, that type of thing, but pretty, pretty minor adjustments between the two. Okay. Right. So for example, ground source heat pump, we really want to keep that around 110. So yeah. if it was to switch over, um, we need some change on the infrastructure. You know, or maybe there's a different technology that we have by then. Um, if we, the, the thought right now is that we'd be able to keep the, all the piping and infrastructure downstream in the building, just changing out the head end equipment of the boiler room. Uh, mm -hmm. Fin tube, for example, um, if it was originally sized, um, you know, for the lower water temp and it went to higher, it's not a problem going backwards. Um, you'd have a little less output of it at that point. So we just want to make sure that we have that covered. Um, if we do go with the gas fired system that we have the provisions in there for the change over to electric in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you retain gas for, for peak shaving or something like that. Uh, we, we could see that um, in other cases, we have had cases where we had electric resistance backup. Um, a good example is a couple of weeks ago when we had that extremely cold temperatures, um, air source heat pumps in some cases were struggling. So they would use an electric resistance as you know some um, additional spare capacity or backup capacity in the coldest temperatures. Um, Jennifer. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on sort of the political component of this, right? Because ultimately, and I think Brian and Justine and Mary spoke to this last week, the ultimate is that we need a yes vote from the town. And I think, you know, having been involved in the finance committee years ago, and this is, I think, about 129 Parker Street, one of the things that was the most important was that the boards were behind whatever it was, and the boards were able to recommend the project. Um, and, and I think we need to, to be in a place where the select board and the finance committee and the school committee are all going to be able to get behind and recommend the project. And, you know, it's, it's not going to be about individual groups. It's going to be about the majority of, of folks who live in Maynard who are going to trust their elected officials with what they say in that public meeting. And so I think, I think we have to have a lens towards that. And then once we get the building designed in that way, and we're having these really thoughtful conversations, then it's all of our jobs, the boards included, to go out to the public and advocate for it. And then if we can do that, then I think we get to that yes vote. I think, you know, we're not in a place now where we can, I, I don't think, where we can go back and sort of survey the community about where their priorities are. I think we're, we're at where we're at. And you know, if we're hearing a lot of concern about the budget and a lot of concern about adding to the tax base and the electrical system that we would put in place is contingent upon maybe getting grant funding and that's not gonna feel good to folks going out to the community members to sell that, I think we need to go the direction that we are. Um, and if, you know, to Justin's point, if we're putting things in place that put us in a better stead in the future, that's part of our messaging too, of like, look, we're not here yet, um, but we're trying to prepare ourselves for the future. Like two cents. I'm sorry, Mary. Yeah. Um, so just piggybacking on what other people have been saying, um, um, I have talked to just as many people that are, you know, I mean, it's it's been out there recently about how we have the ta the highest tax rate in Middlesex County. And I consistently hear, you know, why are we so high and all of that. So there's there's also the contingent that is really focused much more on their pocketbooks. I don't know if it's because of the demographics or our population or what. Um, but um, so that that whole side of it too. And I think I know I had said last week that if it were just philosophical, I would definitely be going with the heat pump version. But um, but just thinking in terms of the budgetary needs and the constraints and what Justine just mentioned about our budget that's already so tight, 
Um, so two pieces on that. Um, I had actually, actually happened to talk to Dave Gavin and talking about having them, you know, all the boards come together to one of our meetings to hear the presentation and that, because just like um, uh, what Jennifer just said, we need the boards to all understand and all be behind it. And David had a really good um, suggestion that we have a Saturday morning um, meeting at like from like nine to two, um, maybe, you know, the end of March, I think the April 3rd date was, was sort of our deadline, but um, so that we really, I can't emphasize it enough that just inviting them to one of our meetings is not enough because we want everybody there. We want them to hear. There's enough questions even among the boards um, for them to be able to hear each other and maybe, you know, we're all in the same room and obviously invite the public too. Um, but just to, to have that concerted effort, that respectful effort to have everybody in, in the room. And the other piece is... Um, not that there's a lot of misinformation out there, but there's a lot of half information. So, you know, for instance, putting together um, a, a, a flyer of, you know, these are the, because it, it, it does seem as though the, the heating system, the, the net zero is definitely the dividing factor. Um, we haven't really heard anything negative for, about the, the building itself. So to put out the word and to put it succinctly, on paper that we can pass it out to people to say, this is how difficult the decision was. And these are the, the reasons that we decided to go this route, um, I think would be time well spent. So those are my thoughts. Thanks, Mary. Um, so Roger Stillwater had a couple of comments. If you don't need a temporary heating system, the lowest cost geothermal option becomes cheaper yet. What about using either the parking area or the Crow Park, or the field behind Fowler Middle School for the well field. Um, I'll just quickly touch on Crow Park. I, I, you know, at the beginning of the job, I know we were told to kind of limit anything we do over there. So that's what I know on that. Chris, I don't know if you want to speak to behind the middle school or. Well, the behind the middle there. school was just, um, was, was a park that, it's a, field that they fundraised private funds um, and uh, basically rebuilt that field. To the tune of $500,000, right? right. <laughs> that would be a bad so, thing. So un unfortunately, I I'm not comfortable recommending that as an option, uh, either of those as an option, just because, again, um, you know, we have heard, I have heard as, as an elected official, um, and I passed it along loud and clear as far as Crow Park, that is not something that, um, that that's basically a non-starter for a lot of residents in town and that would cause a lot of issues. Um, and then again, I, I think we'd have the exact same issue with the field behind Fowler. Um, I think that would, that would cause a lot of problems. Thank you, Justine. Um, and then the last question, in other words, if we confirm the IRA and recognize that this is a rebate paid by the IRS, um, so eliminating the temp heating system and clarifying the firms of the funding could bring us cheaper option presented here. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think ultimately the data that's in this analysis is, is the data that we, we understand and know and have been told. And ultimately, we got a couple scenarios because of a question mark on the IRA incentive. So um, I don't know how to better that. I think Tony has a question. Yeah, just yeah. real, real quick. That uh, so as far as like pro, I mean, believe me, I'm one of the the the, the people who who's a big like you know we need keep crow, we keep our green space. But uh, would it be a temporary thing? Like they put the wells in and then you could put the field back. I mean, and then there's a the cost to put the field back. But is that is, or if you once you put the wells in, forget it. That's kind of just barren space. I don't know how that works. I think you can use the field after it's been dug. Um, I just, I, I can't even imagine having that conversation. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. No, I just want to understand how it actually works. So I'm going to be a giant chicken. I just have to say, I, I defer, but there's no way. As someone whose kid used that field for, uh, for uh, eight, uh, 10 years, I, you know, and many other teams, you know, use that field uh, a lot. So I, I, I appreciate it, it its role. Uh, to ours and, and actually many communities that, that use it as part of our varying uh, recreational activities. But I just I'm just curious if that's one of those things that would be a temporary disruption. That's all. 
Okay, any other questions? Yeah, quick, quick one, yeah. uh, Phil. Um, I didn't raise my electronic hand. I'm sorry about that. Uh, listening to this conversation, it's excellent. Uh, whatever side of the nickel or the dime anybody is coming from, um, we need to keep in mind, we, and I think Jennifer already said that, we need a new school. In 2006, an evaluation, engineering evaluation was done and paid for by, uh, by the town. Uh, and it was done in 2006 by engineering firms that evaluated the high school, which we have since gotten rid of and got a new high school. They also evaluated the Green Meadow School. And they had a laundry list of things that were beyond their life and did not meet, say, present day code in functionality for modern day education. Well, trust me, a lot of those items are still on the list. And that was in 2006. So they haven't improved over time. If we don't get a yes vote on in, in, in the fall, then we're out of MSBA, we're on our own. We still need a new school or we're gonna to have to rehab the school for a number of millions of dollars all on our own. I just want people to keep in mind that there's options. We're talking about two of the options. I'm just throwing the third option in. The third option is we fail in the fall. Now what do we do? We still have to do something with the school. I see Brian has his hand up. He may want to add to this. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. I would chime in here. Um, it's a great discussion tonight, but I think at the at the end of the day, we know we need a new, a new school. Exactly which heating system we choose, I'm fine with any of them. I mean, some of them are, are more sustainable than others. But at the end of the day, you know, we're talking about everything that I've heard in the last few years in Maynard, Crow Park, Green Space. And at the end of the day, we need to get this vote to a yes vote in fall. Because there's no other organization out there that's going to give us $30 million as a town and a school to build a new school. And we desperately need a new school. We're putting band-aids there. We're doing as little as possible to Green Meadow pending this vote. So maybe this is the time, and I think, Jerry, you brought it up sort of cleanly just now, is to put out there that here's what it would potentially cost, and it's not cheap, but it would, it's what it costs to get a new building. And I think we, in my head, I sort of phrase it as as sustainable as we can afford to be. Because I keep hearing people say, well, they did it in X. Well, that's fine, but we're, we're functioning right here and right now in Maynard. And this is what, you know, and Justine brings it up articulately time and time again, we need to get to a place where we can afford the new school. Um, and what you said, Jerry, about what if it's a no vote, which I don't anticipate it being, because we can get to yes. But I think people may need to know in dollars and cents, what it will cost to bring that up to code. And one of the reasons we haven't invested heavily in there is because that building is way outside of ADA compliance. And we haven't had to make it ADA compliant because we haven't invested in that. If we put too much money into it, we will have to bring it up to that level of code. So maybe that's something if, if the team feels that that's appropriate, you know, with Phil and Chris's help to say, if we had to bring that building up to code, this is what it would cost. And it's 100% on the taxpayers. That's. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Now, Mary. Yeah, just one more comment on what Brian just said. Um, when it was appraised, I think the building is appraised at around 600,000. And if we pay, if we invest more than a third into that building over the course of three years, so that's only $200,000 then we are mandated to bring the entire building up to code. So we're walking a tight, tight rope right now. And there's, there's two things. There's two things to remember too. Um, bringing it up to code doesn't give you any more space. So yeah, you can bring it up to code. And we already did that analysis uh, during the um, feasibility study. So we looked at it, we identified, we did narratives on all of those and then a cost estimate. I forgot exactly what it is, but we could dig it out for you for the next meeting. And that was to bring it um, you know, up to a certain position where it would meet the code, but it doesn't give you any more space. As you add space, you're adding the cost and it would not, you know, you would not get reimbursed for that. 
because it wouldn't be part of a MSBA program. Um, Hillary? Sorry, I think that um, one of my fears is as, as people talk about needing to get a yes vote, I think that the Green Maynard folks have been really passionate at turning folks out um, for previous town meetings. And part of my fear is more that, um, that they can prevent a yes vote by um, who turns out to town meeting. And they can be really organized. And I worry that just, um, that that's just another side to things is that, you know, those are a lot of voters as well. Um, Justine, I don't know if you want to talk to that in terms of just kind of outside perspective, every MSBA project has, you know, kind of both sides of the spectrum. So um, it's not, you know, what we got in front of us is an uncommon. Um, and I don't know that we could do a community forum weekly we would never get to that sweet spot where Anthony was kind of throwing out there. How are we going to know? How are we going to know when the percentages lie? We, we wouldn't know. It's going to be do the best you can to get the, the factual data out there. Um, do what we've been doing. We've been reacting to, to what we've been hearing. Um, and, you know, just keep getting the word out and see where the votes come in at. Well, I think that that's, that's also um, the important part to point out also um, regarding a vote is that it's not just the town meeting vote. So the town meeting vote puts it on a ballot. And yep. then, then you have whoever in town comes out to vote at the ballot boxes. And I really think that's where you really don't know. unless If you have a strong project and, and people are confident and they're okay with the cost that you've set and, and the parameters you're doing and what the school looks like, they'll vote yes. But if if they're not, it doesn't matter that it, that there was a contingent that voted yes at, or voted, I mean, and I understand Hillary's point is that I guess you could vote, again, it could go either way. So if a group of people come to town meeting and vote it down at town meeting, then it doesn't even get to the ballot. So that would be a problem. Um, if that group of people comes in support and we get it on the ballot, there could be a group of people that vote it down at the ballot. So it really is such a balance. I mean, we, and it's, and it's funny, I was thinking about this the other day is there's so much more to this building than just this one heat system. Um, and I understand that it is a big deal. And I understand that it's part of our, what we're trying to market ourselves as, you know, a more sustainable town and, and everything else, but there's so many amazing things that will come with this, with this, um, with this new building. And to, I think Tony's, Anthony's um, point regarding the, um, going back to this, the select board meeting, one of the things that David Selectman Gavin had brought up was the master plan. And I do think that that's something that we can go through. And we have, I don't know as if we've done that yet, is to figure out where this project meets the master plan. Um, because one of the things is the net zero goals, but this will be a net zero building. I'm net zero ready, sorry, yeah. misspoke. A net zero ready building. So that is meeting that goal. And to Mary's point, that's that's the information we do have to get out there to people. Um, Nick? Um, I was wondering, uh, something that came up at the last meeting, uh, again, <laughs> everything's going through Justine, it seems, on this. We were talking about... Um, getting down to a certain point, you know, shaving costs overall, getting to a yes vote. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, devil's advocate here playing both sides. You know, if we're talking about a, a million dollars in the overall scope of the job, how much does that boil down to like taxpayer pocket per household per, I guess, whatever. And is that something that you can use to, I mean, I'm sort of swinging back towards, can you say it's only like to the people we need to get a yes vote for something that's more, it costs more. It's like 50 bucks a person and we get the most amazing thing. Like, I, I, have we talked about that? Like, what's this? Do we know that? That's the thing. I mean, we're that, that's right what, now, that's the what numbers that yeah. we're looking at, the numbers we're looking at are either, you know, $5 million, $4.4 million more or $2.5 million more. So it's not, it, and again, it's the operating system. So that's the other part for me 
is the fact that both of those systems cost more to operate unless you do on-site generation. Right, right. So, but I see where you're going. I, I understand. And, and, you know, if it was, a, if it was a difference, I, I don't know, but I just feel like right now, every penny counts, unfortunately. Um, Justin. Hi, this is more of a question for Frank as we're talking about the potential of revisiting the study for repair and code compliance. I'm making assumptions that at the time an HVAC upgrade was part of that study. It may have not yes, have been. Of course. And if was. so, yes. that study's numbers may change as we're anticipating the potential of a opt-in code compliance that would also apply to a renov renovation modification and code upgrade. So understand yes. that that may actually raise that number more as we're right. anticipating that in a new build as well. That was more for the group as a whole. And Frank, I just wanted to confirm that. Yes, yeah, uh, you're absolutely right, Justin. Uh, Mark Anderson. Yeah, I just want to circle back to what Nick was just saying a second ago. I, you know, in my experience sitting in front of community forums and, and public meetings trying to defend projects in the past, um, you know, being able to say that it's only $50 more and we get this great thing it, to, to an extremely logical analytical brain like mine or yours, Nick, that makes a lot of sense and may ring true to us. Um, what I've found is, is that doesn't necessarily ring true with the general population and they're more concerned with the decision making and thought process that went into the project and knowing that we made decisions with cost in mind, or we made decisions with something else in mind throughout the life cycle of the design and the, and the planning process. And that that's what's going to sway them to join the, to, to join forces with the project and support it as opposed to, you know, a dollars and cents argument. That's just my past experiencing. Um, okay. So Roger Stillwater had another question. If I understand rightly, putting geothermal under Crow Park or the parking lot would have a temporary impact during install and the space would then be returned to its original use with no visual change. If this would then make geothermal the most economic option, why is this not being explored? Other municipalities are finding that geothermal has lower geothermal operating costs. Um, I mean, I, I, I said from, I, I, I refuse, and I mean, I'm one person, but I will not touch Crow Park, so. And then I guess, Chris, can you, can you clarify for us, Marty, what's the, what's the number that we're carrying in this geothermal number, 9.45, um, that is the temp heating system portion of it? You're muted. Sorry, um, I'm pulling up my paperwork, but I, I think we were at a hundred thousand for the temp heating system. Okay. Um, right. And that was including uh, rental fuel costs and dismantling. So the overall cost of the temporary system is is relatively small. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what the cost would be to um, restore a park or other areas around the school back to original conditions if we wanted to relocate it, but the cost for the additional, I'm sorry, for the uh, temporary boil system is is pretty small in the overall uh, light of the project. All right, thank you. Um, well, Marty, anything to add here? This other municipalities are finding that geothermal has lower operating costs. Um. I'd, I'd kind of have to see exactly what the, yeah. the speaking of is it just truly for the electrical operating cost or so. Um, yeah, it, it, it's kind of a tough question to answer. Yeah, but we we feel confident in these numbers, obviously. Yeah, the, the, these are based off of um, you know historical data from other projects, published data. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, we're pretty comfortable with those numbers. Okay. Uh, Justine, go ahead. Um, just a quick question regarding those numbers. If um, if other towns that are using geothermal um, had more of a solar offset, would that reduce their operating cost? Would, would that could that be the reason why they're? I mean, I guess it could be anything, but just curious. Yeah, I think it would impact. Obviously, depending on what they have for uh, the power purchase agreement, um, what they're purchasing energy for would have an impact on their total operating cost. Yeah. 
Any other questions or comments on that? So the last thing we wanted to end with is just kind of a reminder on upcoming meetings and kind of the timeline we got. So um, next Monday, March 6th, is our um, SD estimate reconciliation meeting. So that'll be a, a full day uh, reconcil reconciliation of the two estimates. Um, and that process will kind of continue on for that following week or so um, to kind of get to a, a reconciled number. And that number, along with value engineering pricing, will be presented to the building committee on March 20th um, with the goal to get approval on a certain schematic design budget to carry into the submission. Um, a week after that, March 27th, this is when we're going to have all the schematic design documents uploaded for folks to review. In the, in the event, people feel like we should have a, a meeting on April 3rd, a building committee meeting. So uh, any other boards that did the review want to attend and ask questions, we can have that on April 3rd. And then ultimately the, the two meetings to approve the submission, April 17th would be the building committee meeting. And then April 18th would be the board of selectmen meeting. Uh, Mary, go ahead. Sorry, I just, I had a couple of um, general questions um, or one comment um, on March 18th, there's gonna be a community fair at the library that I think it'd be really great if we had representation. I'm already there under two different headings. So, um, but it goes from 10.30 to 12. So I don't know if there's a couple of people that could be there um, to talk about, about Green Meadow, but um, I mean, I can sign you up if you want, if there's a couple of volunteers, um, maybe reach out to me separately or agree now, whatever, but it's um, Saturday, March 18th. And I think there's gonna be a lot of people there because there's a lot of different community groups that are gonna be there. Um, and the other thing, and, and maybe we've spoke of it a little bit, but Greg, um, Greg's still here, right? Um, when we, Greg had originally back in the fall, I think did sort of based on the um, on the numbers at that time with the MSBA and the average assessment and that of households, he gave um, a, sort of an estimate of per household, what this was gonna cost. And now that we've got newer numbers from MSBA, now that they've increased their um, uh, reimbursement and that kind of thing, I'm wondering if we could get something um, similar. That's a good question and something I'm interested. <clears throat> sorry, something I'm interested in too. Um, the that was done by Angie Miramar, the past chief assessor. So I don't know how easy because I've asked. So we're trying to figure out uh, how we can do it again using more updated numbers. But of course, like it's all it's still going to be like pretty broadly right. estimates because of construction costs, unknowns, and bond rates, and et cetera. Right, but it, yeah. and and the and the value of the assessment of the town, which is what what kind of what we base tax bills on so yeah. um, I, I do get asked that quite often so just to even have a ballpark would i'm afraid to give the number now because i know it's old news now but yeah. if um yeah that would be great thank you I, where i am i'm on the same page as you okay thanks okay okay um any other questions or comments right that's all we had jerry I just have to find the mute button. Uh, good meeting, great back and forth, forth discussion, I think, tonight. Uh, and this slide kind of lays out uh, where we're going for the next you know, month and a half, roughly. Uh, I think one of the important ones coming up, uh, which is a, a more the designers and the consultants, is dealing with the reconciliation meeting uh, on March 6th. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I, I know all the answers aren't going to come out of that, but as a result, we may see some numbers a little more fine-tuned, uh, fine-tuned up or fine-tuned down, I don't know, but, but they'll be looked at in more detail, and uh, the assumptions that were made several months ago versus today, who knows, uh, hopefully things will look nicer for us, in other words, cheaper. Um, so. At this point, I don't I don't have anything else. I don't know if anybody else does, but I would like to uh, re request a motion, if it's at all possible, if somebody would like to make a very specific motion. I move to adjourn. Excellent. Just the one I had in mind. Would there be a second? I can second. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'm going to go by a roll call. Hey, Jerry, can I cut yes. you off? I'm sorry. Go there, for was, it. there was one more chat. 
um, from Zanna Kramer. Uh, could you share the estimated EUI for each system? I don't know if Marty is still on. Yep, I'm here. Yes, um, we, we have an EUI target of 25. Yeah, and that falls in line with the the mass saves program, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that that's our goal right now for 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 all systems. Yeah, and then she says in the utility cost assumed for gas and electricity. Uh, yep. Let me. I, I'll have to dig those out, but uh, we do have an assumed cost for it with an escalation rate over the the time. Um, a little bit of a unknown for the escalation for utilities, as we someone mentioned before, it's kind of a commodity you're uh, you're yeah. trying to estimate. But uh, there is a factor carried in for that, so I can provide those. I think there might be an earlier email, but we can take those out. All right, thank you. Yep. All right, thanks. That's it. <laughs> okay, good. No, no, that's important. Don't want to miss any questions that are out there. Uh, how, does, but... how does that answer get out to the group to the to all of us? Like, just wondering. Like, if you dig that information. We'll have Marty get it to Chris and I. I'll get it to Jerry, and he can send it out to the building committee. Um, I don't know that Zanna's on the building committee, so maybe we get it to her directly as well. Yeah. I, I have her contact. I can send that to her. Perfect. Thank you. Good. Perfect. Good question, Nick. Uh, roll call on adjournment. Brian? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Greg? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, uh, you were just thinking about it. I know you, you want to stay. You can stay on. Put out the bag. Okay. Uh, Justin. Yes. Mary. Yes. Uh, Hillary. Is Hillary still on? Uh, yes. Okay. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> All right. Gotcha. Uh, Rob didn't join. Jennifer. I see Jennifer there. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Justine. Yes. Mr. Silver didn't join. Mark Anderson. Yes. Anthony. Yes. And Matthew Johan. Yes. And Nick. Yes. Excellent. Those are all the voting members. And uh, I thank you folks very much. Good meeting. And look forward to, uh, well, I guess you guys are looking forward to a little snow tonight. Is that be correct? Okay, just uh, drop it right. in, Jerry. <laughs> what, what, you, what is it going to be tomorrow in Florida, Jerry? Uh, tomorrow's, I think, 85 oh. or 86. <laughs> I, I don't know. A little, little cooler than last week. It was 90 last week. Which